This unit is about neural language models. Language models that utilize neural networks for predicting the next word. We've seen that n-gram models that effectively are just conditional probability tables suffer from the course of dimensionality. For instance, modeling the joint distribution of n consecutive words with a vocabulary of size v results in intractable um, vocabulary size to the power of n 10 to the power of 40 parameters. Even if we limit um, the history context to 10. However, and this is where the idea um, for this type of neural language models came from. And below I referenced the paper from Josh Benju et al. Neural Probabilistic Language Model, JMLR 2003. However, continuous variables, in, when modeling continuous variables, we obtain generalization much more easily than in this discrete case. Because the function to be learned is expected to behave locally smoothly. And this has been observed in other contexts before. The type of representations that we're going to talk about have been used in other contexts before, but they haven't been used for NLP, and it has made a tremendous impact. They have made a tremendous impact on the performance of NLP algorithms. So that's the difference. Modeling discrete distributions is typically hard. Modeling continuous distributions is easy. So how can we formulate this discrete problem more continuously? You can imagine as an informal description of the question that has been asked. So the core problem is that in discrete word representations, we assume the same distance between any two words. So let's assume W denoting a one-hot encoding of a word. We're going to use this type of encoding throughout this entire unit. Let's assume two different words. Um, think of these vectors, these one-hot vectors as vectors of dimension 30,000, where there is one element is one and the others are zero. So the first word is one, zero, 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 etc. And the second word is zero, one, zero, 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 etc. Then if we subtract these two from each other and compute the L2 norm, so this is the L2 distance between these one hot vectors, we get a distance of square root of two, no matter which combination of any two words we consider, unless it's the same word where the distance is zero. This means all words have the same distance to each other in this simple representation. However, in reality, some words are much more similar than others. So consider the sentences in the following. The cat is walking in the bedroom and the dog is, was running in a room. The sentences at the word level, the one hot level, are very different. But semantically, they are quite related. And having seen the first sentence with the cat should ideally help our machine learning model to generalize making the second sentence <clears throat> uh, also more likely as cat and dog and walking and running and the and a have quite similar semantic rules but this cannot be captured in purely discrete models as n-gram models are. And therefore, the idea that has been put forward in this paper is to use a different representation, a so-called distributed representation that map one hot vectors. These are these long vectors where there's one element is one. In high dimensions, let's say 10,000 vocabulary size, to word embeddings. Uh, which are in R to the power of M of much lower dimensions where maybe M is 30 or 100. Therefore, these representations, these distributed representations, that's where the name uh, comes from, distribute the representations 
along all dimensions of the embedding vector. Before, there was just one one and everything else was zero. So all the information was, if you will, contained in this one dimension. But now we have a real valued vector where there is a different real number for each of these 30 dimensions. And so the semantics of that word is now distributed in that representation. And the advantage of this is that now we're able to model similarity between words. Another way of thinking about this is that these representations, these distributed representations distribute probability mass where it matters rather than uniformly in all directions around each training point, because all the distances are the same. Now we can model something that's more informative. We'll see an illustration of this. And therefore they allow generalization across sentences. These word embeddings, like this mapping from these one hot vectors to the Rm, to these real valued vectors are often realized through a very simple linear mapping. It's basically just a matrix multiplication where the one hot encoder encoding goes in and out comes this lower dimensional vector. It's basically just a matrix lookup that we're doing. And inside that matrix, these embeddings are stored. And then these embeddings become the representation of the word. And they are then further processed by some, for instance, feed forward or recurrent neural network or by a transformer model that we'll get to know in the last unit. Here's another illustration on to give a little bit more a feeling for why this is helpful. But unlike in this illustration, we do, of course, not attach actual labels to words. So this is about semantic relatedness. Right, so this is the current word, this is the next word, and these are some features. You can think of these features as this distributed representation. So a student um, has or is an academic in colleges, are academic, a schoolhouse belongs to academic, and then academic is related to papers. So it's much more likely that any of those are followed by papers than they are fol followed by bill which is maybe more related to le legislators through the politics feature and so forth. But again, this is just an illustration. Of course, we don't actually attach semantically meaningful labels. These are just um, real valued vectors that represent words. So here's a concrete example. Assume a training set with the following three sentences. The cat is walking, the dog is walking, and the cat is sitting. Now a distributed representation should learn or can learn to embed cat and dog nearby so that they are semantically similar. In that 30 dimensional uh, embedding space, they are nearby. And now given that the probability of the cat is sitting is high because it occurred in a training set and cat and dog are related, the probability of the dog is sitting which is not part of the training set, is also high. So this is crucial. We can model through this similarity, we can model sentences to be more likely that are actually not part in the train of the training set. And this is impossible with an Engra model to realize due to the way words are represented. So here's a, a graphical illustration of how these local and distributed representation spaces might look like. So here we have three words and we have a local representation of walking cat and dog, where, as you can already see, this is a one hot encoding. So only for each of these three points, only one element is one and the others are zero. They are, in other words, on the axis and the distance across or between all of these is the same. It's a square root of two, the L2 distance. And now the goal is to transform this into a lower dimensional representation, a distributed representation. In this particular case, we go from three dimensional to two dimensional, where now cat and dog are closer to each other than they are to walking.
And once we have learned this word embeddings, we can also visualize this word embeddings. Here's an example of a two-dimensional T-SNE visualization of a word embedding where you can see these are zoomed in regions. The word embedding is, of course, or the vocabulary is much larger. So we zoom into particular regions and we see that in one region we see countries and the other region we observe dates or years. And so it has learned to relate the semantic entities to each other by learning from text. But we always have to be careful with 2D visualizations. There's this famous quote from Jeff Hinton um, that illustrates how difficult it is to imagine and how easy it is to be misled by high dimensional spaces. They basically said, in a 30 dimensional grocery store, so imagine a 30 dimensional grocery store, anchovies can be next to fish and next to pizza toppings. And so in, in high dimensions, everything can be next to everything. Even though if we visualize word embeddings, we can really just do it in 2D. Everything else is beyond the scope of our imagination. So we need to be careful with visualizations. That's all I wanted to convey. So this paper that I referenced below is the first language model that used a distributed representation, which have been used before mainly in uh, connectionism. Hinton and Alman or symbolic reasoning, but not for language. And there was really a breakthrough in NLP. And everyone is using uh, distributed representations now. So the key ideas for this paper, this is what I took from the paper actually, are to associate with each word in the vocabulary a distributed word feature vector, or in other words, a real valued vector in RM to express the joint probability function of word sequences in terms of the feature vectors of these words in the sequence, and to learn simultaneously the word feature vectors and the word uh, prob parameters of the probability function. So we have an end-to-end -end training process. This was the first end-to-end -end model that simultaneously learned the word feature vectors and the probability function, uh, the parameters of, of the probability function. And this is what the model looks like. This is a picture that I extracted from the paper. And on the left, you can see a informal description. So this model has some inputs, which are the indices of the words. These are, we can think of this as the one hot vectors. And then there is sort of a sequence of these one hot vectors. There's a matrix C that transforms them into an, a word embedding. For each word, we get this 30 dimensional word embedding. And then we concatenate all this, these word embeddings into a big vector. And we have a first layer followed by a tonnage. This is a hidden layer. And then we have a second layer. This is fully connected followed by tonnage. This is fully connected followed by a softmax, where the softmax is then outputting the probability of the next word in the sequence. It's WT, given all the previous words, T minus one, T minus two, all the way until T minus N plus one. This is the context, these previous words. And uh, they also have a small variation of this model where we have direct connections from this first layer to the last layer. Yeah, but here, these are the word embeddings that are concatenated in input to this second layer of the model. The output of this model is the probability of the next word. Here is a more formal description of this model. The probability of word T given all the previous words is a softmax. And here I used Y index of WT because we have this um, uh, what, what I what I use here for W is um, the one hot vector. So I'm using index to get the index of that one hot vector. Um, normalized by all the others. And then the Y's are uh, predictions, um, linear predictions of these direct connections here. This is the first part plus <clears throat> a uh, linear prediction of 
uh, followed by a tanh nonlinearity from x, where x is a concatenation, this concatenation here of all the one hot vectors for each previous word multiplied with this embedding matrix C. So this is C times W is then this 30 dimensional distributed word representation for each word. And each of these uh, C matrices is R in R to the power of M times the vocabulary size. So M is this 30 dimensional low dimensional space and V uh, is the vocabulary size here. And we can already see that now the model scales linearly with um, the vocabulary size, right? Because if we increase the vocabulary, the C also has to increase, but it increases linearly with the vocabulary size. And we use the same C for all um, time steps. So these parameters are shared. But what's different from before is that now the model also scales linearly with N. Before we had the vocabulary size to the power of n. And now the model scales linearly with n because um, we are basically just increasing the length of the concatenated vector that we input to the second layer. And so the number of parameters in that second layer increases linearly, not exponentially. And this is actually a common trick that's used in when, when working with neural networks that instead of representing something, some conditioning explicitly, we, we input the conditioning, oh, the conditioning is an input to a neural network and therefore um, uh, we gain in terms of uh, complexity. We, we, um, the model becomes more tractable. We now have a linear dependency in N rather than having to model the conditioning on each of the combinations of the inputs. It's also something that's, for instance, used in the context of um, reinforcement learning. So the trick is here to make the, um, the words or the word embeddings, or the concatenated word embeddings, an input to a neural network. And so the parameters only grow linearly in contrast to the probability tables that will grow exponentially. So there's a lot of more, a lot more sharing of information and parameters that takes place. So there's a lot of results in that paper, but I just want to summarize them by giving the main results from that paper. And this is, has been copied from, has been taken from that paper. If you're interested in more results, I just recommend to have a look directly at the paper. So the main result is that significantly better results can be obtained when using the neural network in comparison with the best of the n-grams. With a test perplexity difference of about 24%, which was um, significant at the time, on Brown and about 8% on AP News, these are data sets, when taking the MLP versus the n-gram that worked best on the validation set. The results also suggest that the neural network was able to take advantage of more context because we can now make n larger. On Brown, going from two words of context to four words brought improvements to the neural network, not to the n-grams. And this is because um, of the similarities that are learned and the generalization that is implied by that. And they also show that the hidden units are useful and that makes them Mixing the output probabilities of the neural network with interpolated trigram all, uh, also can help to reduce perplexity. So they combined this model even with more traditional trigram models and got a slight improve of performance. So it's an ensemble model effectively. Now, um, just a little side note. Um, this is another paper it's called word to vec Efficient Estimation of Word Representation in Vector Space. One problem that's still that's still there is that, and this is why language modeling is hard, is that at least at the word level is that for large vocabularies, we need to compute a very large softmax. We need to compute a softmax over the next word, over maybe 30,000 or 10,000 word, possible words. And uh, this is both memory um, intensive and computation intensive. 
Now in this paper, what they proposed is uh, so-called skipgrams, where the goal is to predict a word in the surrounding context. It's kind of an unsupervised training task. Instead of predicting a distribution over words, however, they switch to a binary prediction problem where the model is giving pairs of words and just needs to distinguish if the word occurs next to each other in the training corpus or they are sampled randomly. And then they can just use logistic regression as a classification task. And this can be trained very efficiently with lots of data and yields very good word embeddings very efficiently. And then we, we can do some fun stuff with these uh, word embeddings. So what uh, we can do some, some word vector arithmetics. We can see some expression on the left and the nearest most likely token on the right. So we can take the word embedding vector of Paris and subtract the word embedding of France and add Italy and we get Rome as an outcome. Or we can take sushi and subtract Japan and add Germany and we get Bratwurst and so forth. That's quite fun. And it also shows, you know, it's fun, but it also shows um, that the semantics that these word embeddings have learned is actually um, quite meaningful.